the Nintendo Switch is the most successful semi-modern console by a large margin. It sold over 140 million units, but it purely comes from Nintendo's failures that they had right before. The Wii U was Nintendo's biggest failure for a home console. Almost no one bought a Wii U, and with a lack of quality games, it made it really hard to actually want a Wii U. There were great games on the Wii U, no doubt about it, but they're very few and far between. We had Super Mario Maker, Splatoon, Bayonetta 2, and more, but we also had a lot of junk like Animal Crossing Amiibo Festival and Mario Tennis Ultra Smash. And on the other hand, Nintendo was also releasing games for the 3DS. There was certainly a lot more quality over there. The 3DS was at least successful, unlike the Wii U, but it was very clear that Nintendo was stuck in a bit of a rut. The 3DS had a lot more quality than the Wii U, but you could tell that by 2015 they'd kind of moved on. In 2015 is when we first heard about the upcoming Nintendo NX, which was later revealed to be the Nintendo Switch in October 2016. I remember all the Nintendo Directs waiting for the NX to be announced. It was just such an interesting time. Once the Switch launched in March 2017, everything just clicked. Nintendo was back! Nintendo really found what worked, and it all began with The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild was the first giant Nintendo Switch game. Look, Breath of the Wild was always supposed to be a Wii U game. It was announced all the way back in 2013 for a 2014 release, but it just kept getting delayed. I never really cared about Zelda at the time of the Wii U, but I just remember this fabled game that was supposed to be coming out known as Zelda Wii U. I never really cared about it, but I always wanted to see it come out. I mean, it would have been something interesting on the Wii U. But by the time the game was finished, Breath of the Wild was coming out at the same time as the NX, otherwise known as the Nintendo Switch. It truly marked the beginning of the next era of Nintendo. And this game was incredible. The open world environment, the world design, the game design, the shrines, the character design, every single thing about this game just brought back that Nintendo magic that was truly missing in the Wii U era. It really felt like Nintendo was back, and I think this game really pushed that, along with every other title that ended up releasing on the Nintendo Switch, just like its big Mario counterpart that year. Super Mario Odyssey! Hi, I'm Charlie, I'm back, and I think Super Mario Odyssey is one of my favourite games ever. I love this game. This game I got on the day it came out, and I think I've played through the game at least 10 times. I absolutely love everything about the game. From the open-worldness of the levels, to the music, to the ability to explore and collect different moons, to complete this game each time in a completely different way, and each unique boss fight, oh my god this game is just incredible. It's very rare that on my first playthrough of a game I already want to play it again, but with this game I want to play it as many times as I possibly can, it's just that good. Every single section of the game is just so unique compared to the last. All the different costumes, the different ways of collecting moons, this game is just incredible. I am and always will be a Mario guy, so I'm bound to like 99% of Mario games, but this game is just something different. I got this feeling when I first played Super Mario Galaxy as well. Everything is just one big celebration of the past, along with introducing some incredible stuff to the series. Everything is just great. And Jump Up Superstar and the final song of the game is just a chef's kiss to the game. Absolutely fantastic game. If Nintendo's next 3D Mario game is anything like this, then I think we're in for a treat. Not every popular franchise got this treatment though, and it was all because the console seemingly had a problem since the day it came out. See, when the Switch came out, the actual console itself was outdated compared to the PS4 and Xbox One. Of course, the Switch is a very different type of console to the PS4 and Xbox One, being one of the first consoles to have big portable games like this. But when the Switch continued to exist for longer, like when consoles came out like the PS4 Pro, the Xbox One X, PS5 and Xbox Series X, the Switch just became even more outdated. The Switch needed to be more powerful. So what did Nintendo do? What did Nintendo do to upgrade the Switch? They made the Switch OLED. 
Look, the Switch OLED was never really supposed to be the next big step in the Nintendo Switch's life, but it just came out at the wrong time. The Switch OLED was the conclusion for years-long rumours about the Nintendo Switch Pro. The Switch Pro was supposedly going to be an upgraded version of the Switch with better stuff inside the console, more like the 3DS to the new 3DS. But the Switch OLED was just a slightly different Switch. It had a larger screen and an OLED screen. It really didn't seem like Nintendo was really going to do anything for a while. The Switch was left to decay. Nintendo managed to work with their hardware well on first party games that don't start with P and end with Pokemon, but other games just don't work that well compared to Nintendo's own games. You know what? Let's look at these games that start with P and end with Pokemon. Pokemon is such an interesting franchise. See, although every single game in the franchise is published by Nintendo, at least when they're on Nintendo platforms, the games are actually developed by Game Freak and the Pokemon Company which Nintendo only owns a third of. Ever since the game's inception though, the games have always been just slightly outdated. By the time of Pokemon Red and Blue's release in the US and the rest of the world, the games could have easily come out on the Game Boy Color if they waited just a few more months for the Color to release. Since then, every Pokemon generation hangs onto the previous generation console for just a little bit too long. Let's take the DS to 3DS transition as an example. Pokemon Black and White got their DS sequels Black 2 and White 2 in 2012, one year after the 3DS launched. Pokemon would eventually make their first 3DS entry with Pokemon X and Y, but it took them a little bit to actually get to the point of releasing these games on the 3DS. And this was no different with the transition over to the Nintendo Switch. Pokemon Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon released in 2017 after the Switch released. Granted, this was still in a time period where Nintendo was releasing games for the 3DS for literally no reason, but people were really expecting the next Pokemon game to be on the Nintendo Switch. But next year we have the next big Pokemon game! What do you mean it's more similar to Pokemon Go than any other mainline Pokemon game? Pokemon Let's Go Pikachu and Let's Go Eevee are technically remakes of Pokemon Yellow, which itself was a newer version of the original version of Pokemon Red and Green in Japan, but this one incorporated Pokemon Go, the hit 2016 phenomenon that people played for about a week. This game includes forced motion controls, which is fine, and I dealt with it when the game first came out, but my god, Having later Pokemon games on the Switch that don't use this control scheme, this one is just really hard to go back to. This is truly a great introduction point to the Pokemon franchise, but as the first Nintendo Switch Pokemon game, it's certainly an interesting choice if nothing else. But finally, in 2019, we got the release of Pokemon Sword and Shield, which happened to be the second best-selling Pokemon games in the entire franchise. Honestly, this game is quite fun. I've only really played it for about 3 hours, but from what I've played, it really feels like a reinvention of what Pokemon is. But it's not all the way there yet. It almost feels like a game that started development on the 3DS before quickly moving over to the Switch. So it includes some features that show off what the Switch could do, like the random open sections, but the game itself is still pretty linear, all things considered. It even feels more linear than some of the earlier games in the franchise. The game really felt like it was holding my hand throughout my whole play playthrough, really showing me what to do instead of me figuring it out for myself. It also feels like the opening tutorial section goes on for way too long. Over an hour into my playthrough and we're still introducing new features to the game, and we're still introducing how the game actually works. I don't know if it's just me, but I want to figure out the game for myself not constantly be interrupted by NPCs telling me what to do. But at the same time I am rushing through the game, so maybe it's just me. Next however, we got a very interesting game. One that truly doesn't really make that much sense. What the hell did they do? Pokemon Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl are remakes of the DS games Pokemon Diamond and Pearl. And these are just such weird remakes. The game was developed by ILCA. A first for them developing a Pokemon game while Game Freak were busy working on another game set in the land of these games. The original games are top-down 2D Pokemon games, with future remakes and other Pokemon games moving into a 3D style. So what did they do? They made the game sort of like a 2D top-down thing, and look it works with the style of the game, but it really doesn't feel like the next Pokemon game, it feels more like a, like, spin-off or something. 
You go from playing remakes like Pokemon Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire where that game completely reinvented what those games were, whereas these remakes are just Pokemon Diamond and Pearl with a slightly different art style on the Switch. It really doesn't feel like it fits here at all. The cracks in the Pokemon series were starting to show, but just when we thought that Pokemon was beginning to go on a downward spiral, we got Pokemon Legends Arceus. This is what Game Freak was working on. Pokemon Legends Arceus was the first in a new subseries of Pokemon games known as Legends, and it's an open world game that's very much inspired by The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. The open world addition to the Pokemon series is seemingly what the series was missing, with there being more of a mission structure instead of the usual 8 gyms that you have to defeat. And this was honestly really cool. The whole game is in fact an incredibly great concept of what the future of Pokemon could be. But although it's considered to be a main entry in the Pokemon series, it isn't a main game, nor is it a remake. It's just Legends, which is a cool way of separating these games, but it makes this one not the next big Pokemon game. The graphics in the game were also a bit interesting to look at. All things considered, it did look good, but comparing it to games like Breath of the Wild, Xenoblade Chronicles 2, or the future Tears of the Kingdom and Xenoblade Chronicles 3, this game just doesn't really hold up that well compared to those at all. But hey, at least it was nice enough to look at. Seemingly Game Freak is still working out how to do these big open spaces in Pokemon games, which you would have hoped they figured out in Pokemon Sword and Shield, but hey, this is their first time doing something to this scale. But somehow, another set of Pokemon games released this very same year. Ones that would change the view of Pokemon on the Nintendo Switch forever. Where do I even begin? Pokemon Scarlet and Violet are the beginning of the ninth generation of Pokemon and suffer from just so many issues. The game is similar to the previous Legends game, with it being an open world just like that game, but obviously slightly more linear to fit into the normal Pokemon formula. But then it completely breaks that formula by having this school element as if it's Persona 5 or something. And that school element is honestly something that really seems like a cool addition to the franchise. Having this whole extra side of the game is something that I found to be really interesting compared to some of the previous Pokemon games, but the amount of time it takes you to actually get into playing the game without having to go through all of these tutorial-like parts of the game is just a bit ridiculous. When compared to the tutorial part of Breath of the Wild, which hides the fact that it's a tutorial in the first place, it's shocking how long it takes you to get into the game of Scarlet and Violet. And the game itself just feels so rushed. On release, some of the performance and graphics issues were shocking. The amount of glitches found throughout the game was shocking to see in a Nintendo published game. I think at the point I played the game most of these things were at least mostly fixed, but the game itself still feels pretty unpolished. It seems that Game Freak haven't realised how underpowered the Switch really is, and keep making these games with the intent that they're going to be on a much more powerful console. And it makes the Let's Go games and the DS remakes look incredible. The gameplay may be leagues better in Pokemon Scarlet and Violet, there's no doubt about that, but comparing just the way it looks to the DS remakes is just insane. The DS remakes actually look appealing compared to this. But hey, the Switch continued to sell well, but really everyone knew Nintendo was up to something. The upcoming Switch 2 may be coming out, but Nintendo are still at least trying to have something released throughout their most likely final year of the Switch. Whether it be remakes or ports or some original games, hey, at least it's something. So all Nintendo needs to do is not get some bad press. That can't be hard, right? Clearly Nintendo has a very divisive audience when it comes to some of the decisions they make. They've made absolutely fantastic games, but there's clearly something that's always been going on over at their legal department of the company. I've spoken on Yuzu before. Yuzu was a Nintendo Switch emulator to have Nintendo Switch games running on PC and Android. There's obviously other Nintendo Switch emulators, you've definitely let me know that, but Yuzu was clearly the most popular emulator by a large margin. In February 2024, Nintendo, specifically Nintendo of America, filed a lawsuit against the company responsible for the creation of the Yuzu emulator, which eventually led to the team to settle with Nintendo and shut the entire emulator down. It's never been publicly stated what the reason was for the emulator to be shut down, as emulator 
emulation isn't illegal at all. But there was obviously something that Nintendo had, whether it be public or not, against Yuzu that led to this decision. The Yuzu team had a Patreon where they would get money to work on the Yuzu emulator and give people early access to their content. Can I be any more shameless? At least, according to this thread of comments, the reason why Yuzu was taken down may have been connected to this Patreon. No Quality 3587 seems to suggest that the reason Nintendo went after Yuzu and not the other emulator that I can't figure out how to pronounce is that they have released bug fixes on said Patreon for games that need to be obtained through piracy. However, Green Tea seems to think that that's not what happened at all. Green Tea seems to suggest that it had more to do with the one untested in-court aspect of the emulator, which circumvented encryption used as copy protection. Did you know what that meant? I don't know what that meant. Mr. Skinner from The Simpsons got involved with Green Taste thinking it was a stupid theory, but more and more people came up with completely different reasons as to why Yuzu got shut down. There's gotta be some sort of reason, but no one can agree on what that point actually is. The only people that know why it got shut down was Nintendo, but people got really annoyed at Nintendo anyway because emulation is legal. Nintendo actually managed to land themselves in another big story, one that although doesn't really affect the future of Nintendo, it certainly affects the future of community made mods. Look, Gary's mod is a masterpiece. I've loved playing this game ever since I was young. The creativity you could show off in this game was incredible. It being created in the Source Engine, the home to some of my favourite games like the Portal games and Team Fortress 2, was just incredible. I hopped on the Gmod train right before the release of Gmod 13. I still remember playing the beta version of Gmod 13 that they released on Steam alongside the original version of the game and I just had so much fun playing it. And then with the release of Gary's Mod 13 and the Steam Workshop being a part of it, it really opened up the game in my eyes. Being able to download content from several of my other favourite games was so much fun. I always remember having this add-on where the moon from The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask would come down after a certain amount of time, and the Super Mario RPG maps that I'd play on, there was so much stuff going on. It was truly a blessing to play this game and have this much stuff to do. But after a while, I honestly fell out of Gmod. All my friends stopped playing it after a while, and nothing the game ever did really brought me back to playing the game again. I truly loved the game, but I never really got back into it. This was until in April 2024 when it was announced that Nintendo had taken down every single Nintendo add-on on the Steam Workshop. And people were mad. And you know what? Rightfully so. Like okay, it is perfectly in Nintendo's rights to take this stuff down. It is using Nintendo's property, but at the same time it's not made to replace the current Nintendo console or Nintendo games. It's just a fun thing created by the community. And taking it all down really does suck. Nintendo seems to have, for lack of a better term, a stick up their butt when it comes to community created content. But beforehand it was mainly only if it was replacing something that Nintendo was already gonna do. This was one of the first times that Nintendo took something down for seemingly no reason whatsoever. And it just doesn't seem right. People were absolutely furious at Nintendo, as if Nintendo just murdered someone in cold blood. But some other people actually don't believe it came from Nintendo in the first place. But before you all yell at me saying, no it wasn't actually Nintendo, it was this other guy, or it was Nintendo, it wasn't this other guy, I'm not taking either side, I'm just explaining the situation. An online troll by the name of Aaron Peters had been going around on the Steam Workshop pretending to be Nintendo, or at least a representative of Nintendo, sending out fake DMCAs to take down Nintendo related content on games that have a Steam Workshop community, mainly Team Fortress 2, Left 4 Dead 2, Source Filmmaker and Gary's Mod. There had been all this evidence all over Twitter about a month before this announcement showing that Aaron Peters had been recently trolling people with these fake DMCA takedowns with people believing that these new ones were actually done by Aaron and not Nintendo. Now it's incredibly hard to find out who actually took it down. Neither Nintendo or Aaron Peters have officially said anything on the matter whatsoever. But Gary, you know the guy the mod's named after, came out and said that he checked 
and it's officially from Nintendo. People still don't believe that it's actually from Nintendo and Gary was just fooled, but it certainly left a sour taste in people's mouths about the business practices of Nintendo as a company. However, Nintendo still had something left, but this was a bit more positive. Remember the Nintendo Switch Pro rumors? They're back! The successor to the Nintendo Switch has been a large talking point for such a long time, with information coming from all over the place. But I think the first major Nintendo Switch rumour came from Gamescom in 2023. See, back in December 2021, there was a tech demo created by Epic Games that showed off the power of the PS5 and Xbox Series X. This tech demo was known as The Matrix Awakens. It was created to tie into the upcoming movie The Matrix Resurrections, but the demo had all the big stars working on it. It started Keanu Reeves and Carrie Ann Moss, and was directed by Lana Wachowski, who also directed the movie. This demo was the new standard of what these consoles could do. The PS5 and the Xbox Series X supporting 4K resolution and are both incredibly powerful consoles compared to what Nintendo was doing. But what if Nintendo got it running on their own platform anyway? According to several articles, The Matrix Awakens was running on a demo unit of the Nintendo Switch 2 and it was shown to some trusted developers. Holy crap! This means that the upcoming Nintendo Switch 2 must have some pretty high-tech stuff inside. It is said that it is using Nvidia's DLSS upscaling, so it's obviously not as powerful as a PS5 or Xbox Series X, but it is still running it, which is absolutely insane. Nintendo apparently also had an upgraded version of The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild running on the console, which then later became a rumour that they're making an upgraded version of The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. The Switch 2 rumours began. Next came Pokemon Legends Z slash A. Pokemon Day Pokemon Presents announced a new Nintendo Switch Pokemon game at the end. Pokemon Legends Z slash A, finally making Pokemon Z a real thing after X and Y, but it also said it was releasing in 2025. 2025? On the Nintendo Switch? It did say that this game was releasing on the Nintendo Switch, and to be fair, Pokemon always takes at least a year to move to the next console after their main release, but it just seemed odd. And what didn't help is that they kept talking about Pokemon Z slash A coming to the Nintendo Switch family of systems. Of course this could mean the OLED and the light, but it just seemed too strange to call it a family of systems. Look, there isn't much evidence here, but I feel like it should be brought up. Then there's the case of Metroid Prime 4. When's that game that was announced well over five years ago, if not more, actually coming out? There's still no release date. Maybe it's coming out on the new Switch alongside the old Switch. People just kept theorizing until finally, we had something. The new Nintendo Switch will use magnets? Huh? Apparently manufacturers who create accessories got to put their hand in a box and feel the new console? And somehow from that they managed to figure out that it uses magnets? There's a lot of other details too, like backwards compatibility with the old Switch, and other small changes, but it just seems too weird now. Which must mean that we're close. I can just feel it. And suddenly, out of the blue, a new tweet from Nintendo's corporate account was posted. This is Furukawa, president of Nintendo. We will make an announcement about the successor to Nintendo Switch within this fiscal year. It will have been over nine years since we announced the existence of the Nintendo Switch back in March 2015. We will be holding a Nintendo Direct this June regarding the Nintendo Switch software lineup for the latter half of 2014. But please be aware that there will be no mention of the Nintendo Switch successor during that presentation. Oh my god, it's real? Oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, oh my- oh. Oh my god, they're making a new co- Oh my god! Oh my god, they're making a new console! They're doing it! Five year long Joy-Con drift class action lawsuit has ended in a dismissal. Well, they can't all be winners. Look, aside from a few bumps in the road, like pretty major bumps, Nintendo's future honestly looks quite bright. They've got a new console on the horizon, they're coming off of their most successful console if you don't include the DS ever, and they're confident in themselves. People are still buying the Switch. It didn't just die like the Wii. Everything is going good. <gasps> Some alarming news just hit. I thought we had wrapped everything up, but... 
Nintendo bought a company? Have you ever heard of Shiver Entertainment? You most likely haven't, but you'd know some of their work. Shiver Entertainment developed several games for mainly Warner Brothers Entertainment, such as Scribblenauts Showdown, as well as working on ports of Mortal Kombat 11, 1, and Hogwarts Legacy to the Nintendo Switch. They were bought by Embracer Group, a giant company that owns more companies than you could possibly think of, such as Dark Horse Comics, Limited Run Games, IDEOS Montreal, Crystal Dynamics, Gearbox Software, THQ Nordic, and literally like a hundred more. But recently they've been rearranging the way that the company is set up, which led to layoffs and companies being moved all over the place. One of the companies that managed to stay on though was Shiver, but they were just a support studio for the bigger studios. Support studios are often needed throughout the gaming industry. Activision turns almost every one of their companies into support studios for the Call of Duty franchise, and Nintendo even occasionally needs support on their games too. Fun fact, Monolith Soft, a company owned by Nintendo known for the Xeno series of games, actually helped out with both Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom. So as Nintendo is preparing for their next console, they're gonna need another company that's well known for porting games and making use of the technology that they're given, making Shiver Entertainment the clear option to go with. It was a bit shocking that Nintendo chose this company out of, like, all other companies, but people assume that it's because Shiver Entertainment was most likely sold for a low price that it was more helpful to Nintendo for them to actually buy the company. The company is staying at Nintendo, but they'll be working with third parties to help their games go on Nintendo Switch and other platforms? The other platforms part of that sentence is very interesting, with people guessing that it means they'll finish their work that they were doing with other consoles and other games until they work with just Nintendo, which does make complete sense. It'll be interesting though for them to release games on other platforms that were technically worked on by Nintendo, but that's just how things work in the modern video game landscape. So yes, <laughs> Nintendo technically released two Mortal Kombat games or <laughs> whatever. Just like how Microsoft technically helped release all these! I'll get to them one day.